It's back, everybody. The wheel of neurodegeneration. Let's give it a spin and see what we get this time. This video is sponsored by Brilliant. Ding! Huntington's disease. There's been a couple of times on this channel where I've spun this wheel and discussed whatever topic comes up. In the past, I've done Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, and I'll post links to those videos at the end of this video after the outtakes. And if you didn't know I had outtakes at the end of a video until now, there you go. Today the wheel has landed on Huntington's disease, which is pretty good timing, seeing as May is Huntington's Awareness Month. I'm going to start my overview in broad terms, talking about what Huntington's is and what its symptoms are, before zooming in to look at what causes it physically in the body. Then I'm going to zoom in once more, talk about its genetics a bit, and then end on a zoom out to talk briefly about treatments. I'll post timestamps of these different sections below in the comments if you want to jump to something in particular. So first off, what is Huntington's? Huntington's disease is progressive, which isn't meant in a political way, more that it gets worse as time goes on. There's a wide range of symptoms, but the primary cause is the breakdown of brain cells, and that's why it's called a neurodegenerative disorder, because neuro means brain and degeneration means wearing away. Symptoms can become noticeable at any age, but commonly they'll develop between the ages of 35 to 55. There is a form of Huntington's known as juvenile Huntington's because it develops during adolescence or childhood, but it's quite a bit rarer and I'm not going to really go over it here. Being a progressive disease, symptoms change and worsen over time, and there's a really wide range of them. This is important because it means that Huntington's affects every individual differently. So people with Huntington's will experience a mixed bag of the symptoms I'm about to mention. This is similar to Parkinson's disease where I've made about nine different videos videos on different symptoms and I've still not covered them all. Despite there being a wide range of symptoms though, there are some that are characteristic of Huntington's. Initially, it's associated with uncontrollable movement. This may begin with slight involuntary movements and poor coordination, but as time goes on, the uncontrollable movements get more frequent and extreme. Eventually, however, movement ability completely flips, becoming difficult as muscles become rigid. And muscular problems impact your ability to do most things, including including eating and breathing and speaking. Alongside these physical side effects, there's a wide range of mental symptoms too. These may begin with trouble learning new information or difficulty making decisions, but as time goes on, they can include difficulty doing more than one task at once, or short-term memory loss, or an inability to recognise the needs of others, or increased apathy and reduced motivation, which from the outside can seem like laziness. There are also psychiatric symptoms such as depression, and irritability, which may morph into suicidal thoughts and aggression. That's a lot of symptoms I've mentioned, but remember, not everyone will experience all of them. It's easy to associate Huntington's with its physical manifestation, but of course, the mental symptoms are just as real as the movement issues. Increased apathy and aggression are the kind of things that can make you feel, if you experience them, like you're losing your personality or humanity, especially if you don't recognise them as very real real symptoms of a very real disorder, caused by very real chemical changes in your brain. So I always take a moment to try and emphasise that to make sure we don't forget that they're legitimate symptoms too. So that's what Huntington's is, but what causes it? Huntington's is unusual in the world of neurodegenerative diseases because it's very clearly an inherited disorder caused by a very specific genetic mutation. I'll get into more detail on that very shortly, but basically that mutation affects the way a substance called Huntington works in your body. This dysfunctional Huntington then causes the symptoms I mentioned earlier by leading to the death of brain cells. One key part of the brain that's affected is the striatum. Science brain area, striatum. It's here that there's a clear explanation for how movement problems arise. In basic terms, there are two main brain pathways that are affected here. There's the indirect and the direct. The indirect pathway discourages body movement, whereas the direct pathway does the opposite and encourages it. In Huntington's, the indirect pathway is degraded first, meaning that the pro-movement direct pathway has space to take over, and that's what leads to those early symptoms of excessive movement. 
As time goes on, however, the direct pathway also becomes degraded and damaged. And that's why, as Huntington's progresses, the involuntary excessive movements eventually turn to slow, difficult, rigid ones. That's the general idea, but of course, it isn't quite as simple as that. It never is! There are a few different brain areas that get affected, which then leads to that wide variety of symptoms that I mentioned earlier. But despite a range of brain areas being impacted, there's one thing we can seem to trace this all back to, and that's the mutation. Huntington. So in what way is it mutated? What does that even mean, mutated? Before I'd studied genetics, the word mutant just made me think of the X-Men. That is such a tune, isn't it? Well, let me explain the genetics of Huntington's. Huntington's is an inherited disorder, and what's more, it's dominant. In genetic terms, this means not only can you get it from your parents, but you only need to inherit it from one of them to have it yourself. So this might make you think, oh right, there's a gene for Huntington's and I could inherit that from my parents, but it isn't quite as simple as that. It never is! To explain, I need to give a quick overview of what your DNA actually does. Now, genetics can feel quite mind-boggling, but Huntington's allows us to see the very real physical effects of a really simple but extremely dangerous genetic change. So please follow me to my drawing page. Your DNA is a code made up of these things called bases. The order and pattern of these bases tells your body what needs to be made to make you work. There are four base options, cytosine, adenine, guanine, and thymine, which I'll shorten to A, C, G, and T. Your DNA is made up of two strands, with each strand made of a combination of these bases in a specific order. Let's just focus on one strand. Although your DNA is one long code, it's split into sets of mini codes. Each group of three bases makes up one of these mini codes known as a codon. Each codon represents something called an amino acid. So, for example, the trio of CAG, or CAG for short, tells us we need the amino acid glutamine here. There are all sorts of amino acids, each represented on the DNA by different three base combinations. When the DNA is red, there's some steps in between, but ultimately we end up with a chain of these amino acids. And that chain was determined by how the DNA looked, right? So what's the point of this? Well, chains of amino acids are important because they make up proteins. Science word, protein. Yes, it's a science word. Now, I know that the word protein, to someone who hasn't been in touch with science for a while, might conjure up images of shakes and chunks of meat, but in biology, proteins are just tiny little things that your body is full of. They come in all sorts of shapes and sizes, they have all sorts of different roles, and they're basically what keep your body ticking. Heck, they're what made your body in the first place. So everything you do, including stay alive, is governed by these proteins. And a protein is just a chain of amino acids. It's like if your body is a book, the sentences are the proteins and the words are the amino acids. This all means that the order of amino acids is vital. If any of the amino acids are misplaced or altered, that means a protein may be made incorrectly. And if a protein can't do its job properly, then things can go wrong in your body. Just like if a word is changed in our sentence, it could stop making sense or mean something totally different. So let's tie this all back into Huntington's. As I said, in Huntington's, hunting tin is what's affected, and hunting tin is a protein. Within the Huntington gene, quite near the beginning of it, one codon is repeated numerous times. Coincidentally, and because I planned it, this codon is the CAG codon I mentioned earlier. So part of the DNA looks like this. When this is read into a protein, we end up with a long chain of that amino acid glutamine, the one that CAD codes for. Now, having a long chunk of glutamines in the middle of our Huntington protein isn't necessarily an issue. In fact, it's part of the protein. But problems arise when this CAD codon is repeated too many times. If someone has between 10 to 26 CAG repeats, then they're within the healthy range but someone with 40 or more CAG repeats will develop Huntington's at some point in their life. The regions in between show varying levels of risk. Someone with 36 to 39 repeats may develop Huntington's, but we can't be certain. And if they do, it tends to emerge later than in people in the 40 plus bracket, and the symptoms are generally less severe. This leaves the 27 to 35 repeat range. 
It's generally thought that people with this number of CAG repeats don't develop Huntington's, but there's still a risk that their children might. This is because the gene could expand when it's passed on, and that could tip the number of repeats over into the danger zone. It's more likely that men will pass on an expanded version of the gene, as expansions are more common in sperm, and older men specifically carry a greater risk than younger men. The risk is thought to be reasonably small, but still present. However, a study in 2013 suggested that whilst people in that intermediate range didn't really show any movement problems, they did have subtle behavioural differences compared to people within the healthy range, namely increased apathy and suicidal thoughts. And these echo symptoms already associated with Huntington's. There's more research to be done on the topic, but it's worth considering that people who fall in this intermediate CAG repeat range may need support too, even if their symptoms are subtle and might go under the radar. It's absolutely wild to me that something as specific as the number of repeats of one amino acid on one protein in your whole body can have such an impact on your body and your life. But it does. So why? Why does a large number of glutamines cause such a problem in the Huntington protein? Well, with such an excessive amount of glutamines, these chunkier Huntington proteins are far more likely to aggregate or form into clumps. No one told these Huntingtons about social distancing. Much like neurodegenerative diseases I've discussed before, having these clumps of protein in your brain causes major problems. They essentially get in the way of normal functioning and eventually lead to cell death and damage. Each disease I've discussed in the past broadly has a protein associated with it. Parkinson's has alpha-synuclein, Alzheimer's has beta amyloid and tau, and Huntington's has Huntington. That then is the final piece of our puzzle. Those lumps of protein lead to the brain cell death I mentioned earlier, which then leads to the symptoms of Huntington's. That covers what causes Huntington's, so what about treatments? There are two main ways we can go about treating Huntington's. We can treat the symptoms, or we can try and prevent the production of faulty Huntington. In other words, stop the disease at its source. It's safe to say though, at the moment at least, it's the former method that's generally focused on. Most treatments aim to relieve symptoms rather than prevent the disease developing. And this isn't unusual. It's the case for most neurodegenerative disorders. Treatments used to try and help ease movement issues in Huntington's include physiotherapy and the drug tetrabenazine. Science drug, Tetrabenazine. Tetrabenazine works by reducing levels of the chemical dopamine in your brain. Dopamine has a key role in triggering movement, and so reducing it helps to reduce involuntary movements. The other mental and psychiatric symptoms I mentioned earlier are generally treated with methods that aren't Huntington specific. So cognitive behavior therapy or antidepressants may be used to treat depression. Unfortunately, this means that there are symptoms like apathy that aren't really treated in Huntington's because there aren't treatments for them really in any capacity. And that's why I again wanna emphasize the importance of symptoms like this being regarded as legitimate symptoms rather than less frequently talked about side effects. While the lack of preventative treatments is frustrating, as I say, it's a huge problem in neurodegenerative diseases in general. In the massive field of neurodegenerative research across all sorts of disorders, a ton of effort is going into spotting these diseases early. Theoretically, the earlier you spot the disease, the more of the brain you could potentially save before irreversible damage is done. This is one place where Huntington's research has a small advantage. Because the cause of it is so clear and can be predicted, then it's more likely we'll be able to spot it early. And so, if we create a treatment that reduces the production of faulty Huntington, then the disease may be preventable. Note the ifs and the coulds there, because of course, it's not quite that simple. It never is! Despite this point of hopefulness, it is still early days. There is some promising research into methods that block Huntington production, but they're still being trialled in humans. They've not hit the mass market yet. However, However, there is some hope, and something that drives that hope is what I've emphasised in previous videos the importance of the involvement of people with research. The world of scientific research can seem scary and distant and cold, 
but scientists who are doing research need to hear the voices of people who live with these disorders every day. People with Huntington's are such a valuable resource to those who study it, not just because your symptoms can be investigated, but because your experiences can be heard. So whether you have Huntington's or know someone who does, getting involved with research could be a conversation worth having. The reason I'm doing this video is because Peter got in touch with me via my Patreon and suggested I make it. Coincidentally, I'd been wanting to make it for a while, but I'm glad he alerted me to the imminent arrival of Huntington's Awareness Month. He brought my attention to the Huntington's Disease Association, or HDA, and I'm going to link their website below. They have loads of information, including how to get involved with research, so do head on over there if you're interested. I've also linked to a couple of articles from a website called HD Buzz, which is another great resource and explains the genetics of Huntington's really clearly. Whilst Peter gave me the push I needed to make this video, it also wouldn't have happened without the help of Brilliant. Brilliant have been my sponsor for the last few videos and their support means I've been able to give more time to producing content that I care about, like this. And it's perfect because I really like what they do. They have an app and a website where you can learn scientific and mathematical concepts by solving challenges and working with interactive visualizations. No rote formula learning involved, just work through the courses bit by bit, complete challenges of increasing difficulty, and before you know it, you've tackled a topic that you always found cool, but also intimidating. Like I am, <laughs> just kidding. Here's one that I'm really into, an introduction to neural networks. I'm so interested in the brain, as you can probably tell, and so creating a computerized version in the form of artificial intelligence intrigues me. I was worried I'd find it confusing, but Brilliant have helped me work through the topic in a way that's way more enjoyable than sitting in front of a textbook. So if you fancy becoming unafraid of some deep knowledge, then go to brilliant.org slash sofsnotes to sign up for free. And the first 200 of you that follow that link will get 20% off your annual premium subscription. And you'll be helping the channel when you do. It's a win-win. But that's it for now. I hope you found this video useful. And if you think you know of anyone that might find it useful too, please do share it and pass it on. If not, like it if you like it, comment if you have a comment, subscribe if you fancy subscribing to me, follow me on Insta if you want, tweet me if you have any thoughts. And that's it. Thank you so much for watching. Have a lovely day. And remember to keep asking questions. And a huge thank you to my patrons, with a shout out to Adam Dullinger, Terry Cox, Robbie the Space Raccoon, and my new patron, Colette. I could not do this without you lot either. More of that, please. Oh, I didn't realize I was filming. <laughs> hunting tin, hunting tin. How much hunting tin could a hunting tin, hunting tin, if a hunting tin, that is a tongue twister right there. We need to start utilizing that. Hunting tin, hunting tin, hunting tin. This dysfunctional hunting tin is then what causes the symptoms. Causes the symptoms, is the symptoms. I didn't actually mean to be holding this the wrong way, it just worked. Right, that's enough of that. If you want to watch more videos on neurodegeneration, then here's my Alzheimer's video. Or if you just want to watch more in general, then here's a link to a playlist of my personal favourites. Cheers, everyone.